Hello everybody, this is Tim here once again. Here's my review for Scream 4. I just want to start off and go ahead and jump into this review here and say this is a four star film out of a possible four. I think it's better than the second film, but not by much. I think it's just barely better than the second film, just barely edges it out. Only because the second film felt more like a continuation of the first movie. Whereas this movie edges out the second film because it's more fresh to me. This film has a slightly has a slight more of a fresh feeling where you could almost just watch this film on its own without watching the other three films. But at the same time, I don't really feel like this film was needed. The three screen movies were pretty much fine as they were and felt like and pretty much felt like one continuing story. This film pretty much does feel like a film outside of the trilogy. <clears throat> so it's not, I don't really feel like this film is needed, but since it's here, I do think it's the best sequel, but only because it's the one that can stand the most on its own. Um, it's not as good as the first movie. It's only it's better than third. It's only slightly better than part four. I mean part part two. It's only slightly better than part two. Part four is. But just to jump into the movie, when this film was coming out, Wes Craven and uh, Kevin Williamson and everybody. They all said that they wanted like uh, this film to appeal uh, to appeal to like the audience of today or whatever or or of the time it was coming out. I mean, uh, to have a new cast in it uh, to carry on in the sequels. We're, we're supposed to have gotten five and six, but this film didn't do as good at the box office as the other three. And the reason is is because they waited way too long to capitalize on the success of the other three movies. They just waited way too long to make this movie. But um. But yeah, I would still say this is, second, this is the second best movie after part one, because it just has the most fresh feeling to it. And I like that this film goes back to trying to be dark like the first movie, and has more of a brutal feel with the killings like the first movie did. Um, and the third movie was pretty, was almost, I mean, was actually campy. I felt the third movie was in camp territory, where this movie I enjoy that it's going back to the dark territory of the first movie, which I think is pretty cool. I really like the opening of this film. I like how it opens up. Um, I will say this is my second favorite opening after the first movie. I like how it opens up with uh, you think it's like Ghostface getting ready to kill somebody, but it's really like somebody watching the videotape of Stab Six, I believe. <laughs> and then, um, and then you find out that the, the that opening where somebody's watching Stab Six is actually the opening of of fucking Stab Seven, and I'm like. It's a movie within a movie within a movie. You, I don't think you can get any more meta than that. I, I, you pretty much reached your peak right there. I don't think you can get any higher than that. Or any more meta than that, I mean. But I like that. We get to the actual opening kill, though. Uh, the real opening kill. This one girl gets killed off camera, which is, eh. And this other girl, uh, uh, they bring back, like, the style of Tatum's death a little bit from the first movie. This other girl kind of, like, gets... A garage door dropped on her back, which I thought was kind of neat. It's a callback, neat callback to the first movie. And then uh, she gets ready to get stabbed by Ghostface, and then BAM! It hits! Scream 4, baby! <laughs> the movie that a lot of fans were waiting for, including me. I'm a fan of these movies. I was waiting for this film for a long time, too. And I am glad it was made, but it does feel outside of the first three movies. Part of me thinks that they probably should have just left out the three main characters of, of, the, of the three movies, or just had them in... Just had them in smaller roles and not have the films, I don't know, just not have the film revolve around somebody trying to kill Sydney again or something like that. I mean, part of me thinks you could have just had, like, a whole new cast. I really think that's might have been kind of what hurts this, hurt, hurt this motherfucking movie at the box office a little bit, is that you brought back the three main characters from the other three movies, which kids today, you know, the time gap, they probably haven't even seen the original screen, or maybe have heard of it and seen the parodies of it in Scary Movie, but never really actually watched the original film. So I think it would probably have been better if you just had all fresh faces of like new, new and popular actors of today. I mean, part of me thinks that would be better, but I wouldn't want, I really wouldn't want to watch a movie personally, a screen movie, without at least one of the three main characters from the other three movies. But still, I think the movie would have done better in theaters had it been an all-new cast. Honestly, I do. Um, but anyway, just to jump into it, you got an all-new cast other than Sidney, Gale, and Dewey. Sidney's pretty much decided, fuck it, I'm going to profit off of all this crazy shit that's been happening in my life. And she's writing books or whatever about her dealing with her 
crazy ass life and uh, Dewey and Gail they're having uh, hardships in their marriage because she's Gail's kind of depressed because she doesn't know anything to write about because there's no murders happening basically Dewey's just doing his sheriff thing one thing I think is kind of weird in this movie is when the murders start happening Dewey doesn't seem like he wants Gail to help which I'm help him which I'm wondering why she's helped him in the other three movies uh, I never really understood that in the movie He's like, it's. he kind of seems like he doesn't want her help because he's sheriff and she's the media, I guess. But at the same time, I'm like, she's your wife. I mean, shouldn't you trust her a little bit more than that? But whatever. There's also this blonde-haired girl in the movie who, uh, name, I think the character's name is Deputy Judy, who, like, works alongside David R. Kent's character. And she, like, has the hots for him, basically, and she keeps making him these uh, lemon square things. And Courtney Cox tells her that her lemon squares taste like ass, and David R. Kent's like, no, no, they don't. I thought that was funny. Another thing I thought was funny is that when the kids are all talking to David R. Kent after the murder has happened, or the murder at the beginning of the movie, um, uh, Hayden Panettiere, uh, who is like really hot, Hayden Panettiere is, she's like super hot, especially in this movie. She's uh, sitting there talking to uh, David R. Kent, and she's like, I didn't get a phone call. Does that mean I'm going to be killed? And David R. Kent's like, no. Well, maybe. <laughs> oh, that, that was fucking hilarious. I... I love that. Another thing about this movie is you got Anthony Anderson as a cop. Anthony Anderson is the last guy I expected to see in a Scream movie, I'll be honest. I'm really surprised that he was in this movie. But he doesn't hurt the movie or anything, but I was really taken by surprise seeing him in this movie as a cop. But anyway, and Sydney's got this agent who works with her, and she's like really obnoxious and keeps acting like a douchebag, and Sydney fires her because she's a douchebag, and then Sydney's agent gets killed in the parking lot, and it's dark and deserted. It's kind of a creepy scene where she's running to the door, and the ghost face just pops out of the shadows, runs directly to her, and just, like, knifes her right in the chest. Like I said, the kills in this movie feel much more, I guess, or feel more brutal, I guess, in a way, than the kills in Part 3, which which were extremely tame. <laughs> it wasn't just that they were tame. It's just that Scream 3 itself was a much campier movie than this one, which has a much darker quality to it than that than part three. But um her agent gets killed and then her fucking body gets thrown off the top of a building and lands on top of a, I believe a news van while Dewey's like giving a speech to the town about uh not to worry about the murders and shit like that. Courtney Cox decides to go out on her own and try to solve these murders and she goes to like this big stabathon party that these kids are having. You got Roy Culkin in the movie. I believe it's Roy Culkin. Uh, I'm not sure how many Culkins they are, <laughs> but I believe it's Roy Culkin. I think it's the one from the movie Signs. I believe it's the guy from Signs. I th well, he was a kid in that movie, but I believe it's the same actor. But uh, you got Roy Culkin in the movie. He's pretty much like Jamie Kennedy's character from Part 1 and 2. Um, well, and 3, with his cameo in 3. He's pretty much like Jamie Kennedy's character, Randy. He's got a friend who's like this dude who keeps videotaping his, uh, or a uh, broadcasting his high school experiences or whatever on the internet. I'm like, why would that even get any views? Who gives a fuck about some random high school kids like high school experiences? I mean, who gives a fuck? Why would that be important? People are more, more prone to watch stuff about like a tragic uh, person with a lot of crazy shit going on in their life than just some kid walking through high school and his day-to-day -day activity. It's like, I believe the character's name is Robbie. It's like, hey, this is Robbie. I'm eating pizza today. Uh, I'm like, what? who the fuck does that? Who video, who broadcasts their entire high school life on the internet? That's kind of stupid, but anyway. And you got this girl, Jill, who's Sydney's cousin, who the killer is pretty much targeting for most of the movie. Uh, and then you got uh, her boyfriend, ex-boyfriend Trevor, um, who cheated on her. They, the movie tries to make you think he's the killer for most of the film, with a lot of ominous, ominous looks he keeps giving the camera and shit. Uh, but you obviously know it's not him. Once again, that would just be too easy. <laughs> and then you got Hayden Panettiere, who's like a friend of Jill's. I think her character's name is Kirby. She does the best acting out of the new cast in the movie. And her character comes off as the most likable of the group. Um, she's not anything amazing, but her character is the most likable of the group. Plus, she's like super hot, so that counts for something right there. But anyway. And, uh... You got, uh, Jill has another friend, but the character's like so forgettable that you don't even give a fuck. She gets attacked by Ghostface in her house. Um, I kind of like this. It's like Jill and Kirby are in, over there in their house, and they can, Jill can see her friend from her window over there, and 
<clears throat> in her own house, like the houses are just like right next to each other. And they can look at each other through their windows or whatever, bedroom windows. And uh, they're watching Shaun of the Dead, Jill, and Kirby are. And uh, Ghostface calls him, starts fucking with him, tells him he's in the closet. They open the closet, and he goes, I didn't mean, I didn't say I was in your closet. He pops out of Jill's friend's closet, fucking starts knifing her, and he throws her through a window. Like, her part of her body, he throws it through a window, which, once again, the kills just felt more intense here in this movie than they did in the third one. Um, but, uh, and then Sydney goes over there and finds her body and her fucking, like, intestines are laying on the bed and shit. Um, I love that. That was great. It kind of took me back to the first movie when um, Steve, I believe it was the guy's name, the the jock guy at the beginning, Drew Barrymore's boyfriend, got his guts like cut out or whatever. Um, kind of brought me back to that. Um, but yeah, uh, I love that. I love that there's that there was gore right there. Scream, I don't think, is a series that's known for its gore, but I like that there was an intestine there hanging to me. Well, I mean, some people might be like, you like somebody with their intestines hanging out, but. I enjoy my gore, so I'm a gore hound. I can't help it. But um, but uh, and you uh, you got Anthony Anderson and his partner, which I think the actor's name is Adam Brody, who was also um, what was that shitty ass Bruce Willis movie Kevin Smith did, Cop Out? I think Adam Brody may have also been in Cop Out. I'm not for sure. Um, but uh, you got him in there, and I find it funny how they're like they're having to like watch Jill's house. And um, uh, they're, like, sitting there talking about how cops always die in these movies unless you're Bruce Willis. And, of course, they actually do die. Um, Adam Brody gets stabbed in the back, I believe. And then Anthony Anderson gets a knife, like, right to the fucking head. And I'm like, dang, man. Oh, shit. It looks like it hurt. But then he gets out of the car, and he's, like, swinging around. And then he falls down on his knees, and he gets a one-liner, and he says, fuck Bruce Willis, and falls over dead. And I'm like, uh you don't need you don't need the fuck Bruce Willis thrown in there. Just makes the movie feel more campy, especially with the more darker vibe it's trying to do. Kind of upsets the tone. You don't really need that there. Um, Sydney gets a uh, so Sydney gets attacked in the movie, and I like when she. <laughs> this is like right after Jill's friend gets killed. Her other friend, whose character is forgettable, it's right after Jill's friend gets killed, and Sydney's over there in the house. Uh, Sydney gets attacked, and I like how she does like a kung fu kick and kicks the killer in the face. And then, of course, the motherfucker gets away. Um, <laughs> they have a uh, Roy Culkin and his friend Robbie, or whatever in the movie. Well, that's just the character's name, I believe. What was Roy Culkin's character's name in this movie? What the fuck was his name in this movie? Charlie. Shit, Charlie. That's it. I almost forgot. Uh, yeah, Charlie and Robbie or whatever, they're hosting this Sabathon. Um, this is later in the movie. Um, then, uh, Gail goes undercover at Sabathon. She sneaks in there trying to find the killer. And one thing, uh, that's kind of underdone in the movie is, like, they're, uh, Charlie and, um, uh, Charlie and, like, Robbie, they're trying to give a list of, like, the new horror movie rules of today or whatever. And the rules aren't entirely fleshed out and don't really matter to the overall plot of, of this particular screen movie. They kind of underwhelmed it there with the rule department as far as like this movie goes. They're pretty pretty much trying to say that this movie, sh uh, that the killer in this movie is trying to kill people in like a remake style of the original movie. Which I thought was interesting. Each screen movie has pretty much poked, uh, poked fun or slightly fun or whatever or uh, try to satirize each like ver uh, each style of horror movie it's trying to do like an original sequel or each uh, category or whatever uh, trilogy now we get remake um, I like that but once again the rules aren't really defined but you get to the stabathon party of course the killer shows up there he attacks Gail stabs her in the shoulder instead of in the gut or something once again the the main three characters just feel too fucking safe in this movie uh, I mean they they don't feel as safe as part three, but at the same time, by the end of the movie, big spoiler, they're pretty much the only three characters left, so I'm like, uh, it's just it's kind of the same thing again. I really think that at least one of the three main characters should have died in this movie. But Gail gets stabbed in the shoulder, but she manages to get away because Dewey shoots the killer, but of course the motherfucker's probably wearing a vest, so he gets away. Um, and then Gail's pretty much out of the movie for the rest of the movie until the end. And then there's like an after party thing at Kirby's house where the last people left over in the cast are there. Um, Sydney starts heading there. 
And uh, the killer shows up there. Once again, they kind of try to make you think Trevor's the killer, but you know it's not fucking Trevor. Pretty much, Trevor's the only character in the movie the movie tr really tries to make you think is the killer, so it's kind of a letdown in that department. Uh, but um, <sighs> the killer shows up there, and he kills Robbie, Charlie's friend. One thing I find funny is that earlier in the movie, they, uh, they uh, the characters say that you pretty much have to be gay. You pretty much have to be gay to survive a horror movie these days. And Robbie's getting ready to be killed by Ghostface, and he goes, You can't kill me. I'm gay. Those are the rules. And then he kills him anyway. I thought that was funny. But, um, yeah, I actually laughed at that. Um, and then Sydney, Sydney shows up there. She starts trying to hide, hide Jill from the killer. Um, fucking, uh, Charlie gets kidnapped by the killer and he gets tied up outside and Ghostface is talking to, um, uh, is talking to Kirby on the phone. But, but by this point, you... I like how, for, big spoiler, obviously, Jill is the killer. Jill and Charlie are the killers. I like that it was like the actual girl they tried to make you think was the main target turns out to be the killer. I like that. But by the end of the movie, you can guess that it's her because Charlie's been kidnapped and tied up by Ghostface. So the only one missing from the scene at the end is Jill. So who the fuck else could it be unless they're going to pull a surprise, like, random character who you saw for five seconds who didn't mean shit to the overall plot winds up being the killer, which that would be a cheat, but it's obviously it's Jill, so the twist kind of gets spoiled at the end, and then well, one thing I love here is like the killer's talking to Kirby though, and he asks her horror movie questions, and he's like, what's Jason's weapon, Freddy's weapon, whatever, and she gets them all right, and shit, he asks her, name the remake of the groundbreaking horror film or something like that. And she starts naming off every friggin' remake in existence. I love that because there's so many damn remakes. It's almost, it's, pre it's pretty much pathetic of Hollywood to keep doing so many fucking remakes of classic horror movies. It's really pathetic. But uh, I love that. And then she runs out there to get Charlie loose. And of course you figure, obviously, that he's in on it as well. So he gets up and he's he stabs uh, Kirby, which you saw coming from a mile away. You could just kind of, you just pretty much predict that easily, that he was also in on it. So Kirby's laying there bleeding out. You don't really see Hannah, uh, Hayden Panitaria die. But, um, I mean, pretty much assume she's dead. I mean, she pretty much is dead. But I, but she seems to be a character that fans like. So if they ever do make a part five and want to bring back some characters from this movie, I can see her as one that they probably would bring back. But Pretty much only her. Um, and then Charlie takes off after Sydney, and then Jill shows up. You find out, dun dun dun, Jill's the killer, <laughs> which was predictable at the end here. But one thing I love is that Jill wants to be a killer because she wants to paint herself as a victim like Sydney, so she can get fuckload of media exposure because she doesn't want to become famous on her own or work for it or anything. She just wants all of her shit handed to her. Like, people, uh, <laughs> she pretty much talks about how people can, like, make internet videos and have fucked up shit happen to them and things like that and become famous because of that. The whole web generation of today or whatever. So she wants to do the same thing, pretty much. Become famous because of a fucked up incident and not have to actually put forth any effort in life. Um, but she, so she has to eliminate Sydney because she wants to be the only survivor and take the spotlight from Sydney, pretty much. And, of course, she has set Charlie up to take the fall for the murders. Uh, so she kills her accomplice. <laughs> Another thing is that Jill is, Jill, I mean, this actress, she's all, she's all right. She's not anything to write home about, but she's all right. She does all right in the movie. Her as the killer, though, some people don't really buy because she's like a, uh, supposed to be like a 17-year-old girl. And this girl is like so tiny that plays Jill. And I, really, I really don't buy her killing anything except for maybe like Rice Krispie cereal. <laughs> but uh, I mean, she does all right. But but in the movie though, I got I kind of got the point that she was more of the mastermind and thought the whole plan up and everything. And Charlie, Roy Culkin's character is pretty much the one that carried out almost all the killings. Oh, another thing I forgot is that Jill's mom in the movie also gets killed. She gets like stabbed uh, through a mail slot. Uh, her character is like completely forgettable in the movie. And if I want, uh, and it makes perfect sense that I would have uh, would have gone through this entire review without remembering her, because, and if you watch the deleted scene, she has some scenes that were cut, and so that explains pretty much why her character is so forgettable, because all her shit was cut out of the movie. 
But, um, and then another thing, Trevor, she wants Trevor to take the fall. She basically wants people to think that Trevor is like Billy and uh, Charlie is Stu. Like, uh, they're like the new versions of the killers from the first movie. And one thing I find funny is that Trevor cheated on her and she shoots him in the dick and then she shoots him in the head. I thought that was hilarious. Uh, that just made me laugh. <laughs> but uh, I did think that was pretty hardcore, though, how she just blows his fucking brains out. <laughs> That's pretty hardcore for the movie. Um, so she stabs, she Jill stabs Sydney, takes Sydney down, and then she proceeds, she proceeds to beat the shit out of herself, to make herself look like a victim, scratching herself with Trevor's fingernails and using his hand to like pull some of her hair out. Oh, that was kind of neat. Uh, I do think she kind of went overkill though when she like leaps backwards on like a fucking glass table. I'm like, you don't have to go that far. That's a little much. <laughs> and then she like crawls over there to Sydney and's like. And the police show up and shit, Dewey shows up, and then the movie pretty much should have ended there, but they take it to a hospital setting, which I find funny, because Sydney's in critical condition, but she's pulling through, and so Jill has to take Sydney out, because she wants to be the only survivor, and of course, if Sydney wakes up, she'll, you know, tell everybody that it was Jill who did everything, and so Jill goes to take Sydney out, <clears throat> Dewey come, Dewey finds out that uh, Jill is uh, also a killer, he comes rushing in there, he gets his brains knocked out with looks like a bedpan. So that was, I kind of enjoyed that. No, I like Dewey's character in this movie in this one more than I did. I mean, well, I mean, I like, Dewey's character in this one has kind of lost some of the buffoonishness and silliness that he had in the other movies. I kind of like that silliness, but with part two and three, I felt like they were pushing it a little. I kind of like how he's more of uh, normal in this movie without kind of his silliness that he had in those movies. He just seems more toned down to me in this movie. But I, I like that. I like that. He gets shit beat out of him in the head with a bread pan, though. It's hard for me to... And Jill and Sydney get in the fight, and it's hard for me to buy uh, Jill, this little puny girl, like grabbing Nev Campbell and slamming her up against the wall. It's kind of hard for me to buy that, but once again, the girl that plays Jill, her acting is all right. She's not horrible. Um, her The killer reveal in this movie of the killer being like who you thought was going to be the main final girl is better than the killer reveal from part three where it's like the long lost brother or whatever. But um I found that guy in part three though. I mean, I bought him more as being able to kill people than I do this little girl in this movie. Although I like although I like this character better with the whole media thing and everything, how she's wanting to be famous. I like her like her craziness, the way she acts, I like it better. But it's still kinda hard for me to buy this little girl just such a look, such a small girl. This actress is just looks. She just looks so tiny to me. It's just kind of hard for me to buy her throwing Nev Campbell around. But I do like how she like puts her knee in the Nev Campbell's wound and shit. So overall, uh, I do like. I like the brutalness of this girl, this character of Jill, better than I do the guy from the third movie. And just like her being Cindy's cousin, I just like that overall better than like her long lost half brother from the third movie. So I like her better than the guy from the third movie. But I bought him more as being able to like throw people around and shit though than I do her. But at the same time though, the only instance where I don't truly buy her like throwing somebody around or whatever or taking somebody out is when she like grabs Sydney and throws her right up against like a medicine cabinet or whatever. That's a little hard for me to swallow. But other than that, she's alright. She's She's definitely better than me than the guy from three. Uh, but um, but then Gail shows up with uh this with Deputy Judy, who's like this, who's uh the girl that had a crush on Dewey or whatever in the movie, and um, Deputy Judy gets shot down. She's actually kind of hot too. This blonde haired chick's kind of hot too. The girl, the actress that plays Je Deputy Judy, she's pretty hot too. She, I believe, she was actually in Planet Terror, the Robert Rodriguez movie, the Grindhouse movie. Uh, yeah, she's she's all right. I mean, her character, give or take, but the actress is pretty hot, I think. I think so, anyway, I me mean, personally. So at least she gets some hot chicks in the movie. But, um, and, uh, one thing I love here is that, uh, is that, uh, I love the way Jill gets taken out. Sydney comes up behind her and puts, like, these defibrillator things to her head and shocks her brains out. And then, uh, and then, uh, Sydney gets the great one-liner where she says, the, uh, the first rule about remakes, Jill, don't fuck with the original. I love that. And then, uh, <clears throat> of course, Sydney knows that the killer is never truly dead unless they get a, like a, a one last shot. And so Jill's like sneaking up behind him with a shard of glass. 
and uh, fucking Sydney grabs the gun, automatically turns around and shoots her directly in uh, the chest, I believe, and takes her out. And then I love how the media at the end is like talking like, Jill Roberts, we can't wait to hear from her. A survivor's story or whatever. <laughs> I love that. And then the movie ends. Uh, but yeah, just I, this movie just feels more fresh to me than part two, where part two kind of feels like it's comparing its kind of feels like you need to compare it at least against part one where it feels like it's carrying itself over from that this film feels more like it can almost stand on its own but i do feel like you'd get more enrichment with the film if you watch the other three but all in all i would say this film slightly edges out part two for me which i gave part two three and a half and this film gets four so it's only slightly better to me than part two but all in all i'd say this is my favorite sequel after after part i mean this is my favorite movie after part one as far as the scream franchise goes you could do a part five i don't know where you would take it i have no idea some fans online have talked about how it would be cool if there was like multiple killers who had like different agendas or whatever and maybe even start killing each other or something like that uh that kind of stuff would probably be interesting or maybe there was even another killer that you didn't even know about you could do something clever like that that kind of stuff would probably be interesting but once again they've killed off all almost all the characters in this movie in part four so i don't there's not really hardly anybody you can bring back for five actually so I'm like, they probably should have at least left, left at least one or two people left. That way you could have brought back some characters from 4 and 5. But pretty much now, as far as the Scream franchise goes, you're getting a TV series, which is cool. Uh, I mean, I don't really know how the, I mean, it's neat. Well, not really cool, but it's neat that they're making a TV series of Scream. I don't know how the fuck you can do a TV series of Scream. At least, I don't know how you can do a long-lasting TV series of Scream. I mean, every episode is Ghostface going to call somebody on the phone and kill him in every episode or what? I don't get that. Uh, but, but anyway, you could, if you wanted to, if you could get the actors and bring in, like, some of the people from the movie series and, like, cameos or whatever, that'd be kind of neat. Uh, maybe even for Scream 5, you could have, like, somebody in real life, like, have it be even more meta and have it take place in the actual real world. Where it's like somebody actually trying to copycat the actual screen movies and be a real ghost face killer. That would, that would, that kind of, I think that's kind of interesting. But once again, movies like that are generally, that, that do that are not really liked by the fans though. Because they don't, I don't think they like, I mean, I think it gives them the feeling that they're like their franchise and their characters were kind of meaningless if they, uh, if they just come right out and say they weren't real. It kind of breaks the illusion and fun of it. I mean, really. And I can see that. I do think it kind of does that. But I do think that would be kind of an interesting idea for a part five. Because there's not really many other places you could take it. I mean, to be honest, you could kind of just stop here. But Sydney's character, I really feels like, I really feel like she needs to, like, get a family or something. I mean, she needs to, I really feel like they need to be done with her character. If they ever do a part five, they need, they really do need a new lead. Maybe have Sydney there in, like, a really tiny role. But she does not need to be a main role. They need a new main hero, somebody else to take out the killer in the end. Sydney really needs to, her her story is done. It needs to be finished. If they ever do a part five, they do need somebody else. But yeah, as far as that's pretty much my wrap up on the screen movies. Like I said, I love the first one. It's a great movie. The second one I think is pretty good. Really it's an enjoyable sequel. But not anything great, but pretty good. Part three is just an alright movie. Uh, don't go out of your don't go out of your way to see it. But if you enjoy part one and two, fuck it, watch it. I would. Uh, part four, I do recommend it, but it didn't need to be made, and you, and it doesn't really have much to do with the three previous movies. It kind of stands outside them. So, but uh, but but it's still a good movie. I mean, it's still a really good movie. I still give it four stars because it feels fresh and can stand on its own pretty much almost. But I do think you should still at least see the other three movies. But yeah, all in all, that's my wrap up for the screen movies. And I'll see you guys again with whatever I'm going to be back with next.